Hello, and welcome to Nostalgic Medicine, where we take a look at fascinating stories about the history of medicine and healthcare. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the history of tobacco smoking. I think everyone will agree with me when I say that tobacco smoking is one of the single most harmful things you can do to your body, yet one in five people worldwide still smoke, and it is indeed the leading cause of preventable death in the whole world. But tobacco smoking is thousands of years old, and we only conclusively proved that it's bad for you around 70 years ago, so the question that some of you may have wondered is why it did take so long. And how exactly did we prove that it was bad for you? I'm going to answer these questions in this video as we take a look at the rise and fall of tobacco. So whenever I mention smoking in this video, I'm specifically talking about the burning and inhaling of tobacco plants which are a group of dozens of different plant species belonging to a genus of plants called Nicotiana. These plants contain nicotine, which is an extremely addictive substance, but when you burn them they also release dozens of carcinogens such as tar, nitrosamines and free radical compounds, which are all terrible for your health. Tobacco plants are native to North and South America, and indigenous American people are known to have smoked this plant for thousands of years, both for recreational purposes and in religious ceremonies. So yes, that does mean that the people from the old world continents had no idea what tobacco was until they first set foot into the Americas. And indeed, Christopher Columbus and the men in his ship in 1492 were the very first Europeans to ever smoke tobacco. Once the plant was brought to Europe, Africa and Asia, it became an immediate hit and it was one of the most popular crops that was grown and sold as part of the Atlantic slave trade. And people consumed it in many different ways, whether it was by smoking, sniffing or chewing and also used many different accessories to inhale it, such as pipes, hookah, cigars and cigarettes. Most people used tobacco recreationally, but others used it for its reported health effects as some people believed that it could do things like treat the common cold, prevent pain, as well as treat cancer, quite ironically as you'll find out. But they also believed that it can create a balance in your bodily humours because of its property as a hot and dry substance, because remember, humorism was still a very common belief well into the 1800s. However, some people early on did have negative views about the health effects of tobacco smoking, with the most prominent of them being King James I of the UK. He wrote a scathing essay on the substance in 1604 called The Counterblast to Tobacco, in which he quite prophetically described smoking as, quote, loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, and dangerous to the lungs. And King James did try to limit smoking in the UK by introducing a tobacco tax, but this did very little and the incredibly addictive substance remained in high demand for the next 300 years. Tobacco smoking would see an even further explosion in popularity in the 1880s after an American inventor developed a cigarette rolling machine. Before then, you had to roll cigarettes by hand and the biggest companies could only make around 40,000 a day, but this machine increased the production a hundredfold, allowing them to make a whopping 4 million a day. And of course, more cigarettes mean more consumers of tobacco. However, what people at the time didn't know was that using cigarettes to inhale tobacco as opposed to the other methods meant that a greater concentration of smoke was getting into the lungs and at the same time that there was a massive increase in smoking rates around the start of the 20th century, there was also a massive increase in the incidence of lung cancer, which was previously an extremely rare disease. So 
so doctors everywhere around the world started noticing a drastic increase in lung cancer rates that seemed to have begun at the start of the 20th century and people had many different theories about why this was happening. Some of the causes that were proposed included increased air pollution from cars and factories, concrete roads, gas exposure due to World War I, and even the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. But you'll never guess who were the first group of people to link cigarette smoking with this increase. It was the Nazis, specifically thanks to the research of a doctor in Nazi Germany called Fritz Lickint. And Adolf Hitler in his classical racial language would describe tobacco as the rough of the red man against the white man, saying that so many excellent men have been lost to tobacco poisoning. As a result of this research, he imposed smoking bans, reduced the rations of cigarettes to his soldiers, and funded anti-smoking propaganda ads. But this anti-smoking campaign never really spread anywhere outside of Germany, which is probably the one good thing that the Nazis could have spread, and it completely seized in the country when the Nazi regime collapsed in 1945. But thankfully, it wasn't too long after this that the science everywhere else in the world started to catch up. The paper that would mark the first blow for smoking was published by two British doctors called Richard Dahl and Bradford Hill in 1950. What they did in this paper was to look at thousands of people who had been admitted to a few hospitals in London with various different types of cancer and other serious diseases and they found out whether these patients smoked or not. The data showed that lung cancer patients had a much higher rate of smoking than patients with any other disease meaning that smoking must be a key factor in causing lung cancer. Other researchers around the world, including the USA, had similar findings to this, and the pressure was mounting on tobacco companies to do something about it. They basically had two choices. They can either admit that smoking was harmful, or they could outright deny the science. As you expect, money talks. And what they chose to do was closer to the second option. The CEOs of all the big American cigarette companies got together in 1953 and authorised the publication of what they called a frank statement to cigarette smokers. This was a short essay that was published in the pages of 400 different newspaper outlets, reaching about 43 million Americans. It basically aimed to create doubt in the public's mind about whether smoking really caused lung cancer by saying that we don't know everything about lung cancer yet and that there are many other potential causes. They also said that the case control and animal studies that had been done were not the gold standard in proving causation, which technically was correct. The cigarette companies also claimed to care about the health of the general public and that they will support any research into the causes of lung cancer. But what the research was, was paying off any reputable scientist who was willing to speak in favour of tobacco. And these scientists were often smokers themselves, and would therefore want to sow doubts into the lung cancer link. Well, regardless of all this, better research into smoking and lung cancer would be done such as the British doctor's study conducted by the same duo of Dahl and Hill. This study looked at thousands of doctors and divided them into groups based on whether they were smokers or non-smokers and then followed them up for every few years to see if they developed any diseases. Well, as you might expect, the deaths from lung cancer were stunning 15 times higher in smokers than in non-smokers. And it also found out that smokers were more likely to have other cancers, as well as heart attacks or strokes, and they unsurprisingly had an overall shorter life expectancy. If this study wasn't convincing enough, there have literally been thousands of studies that have been done since it demonstrating the various adverse effects of tobacco smoke, and even cigarette companies admit this fact nowadays, which they actually knew all along. Something very important that the doctor's study did was bring about the creation of a very influential concept called the Bradford Hill Criteria, 
which is a list of criteria that you can use to imply causation when you find a correlation. This concept is especially important for smoking, because obviously, I don't think anyone would allow you to do a randomised control trial on tobacco smoking. So it was from around the 1960s that it became universally accepted by the scientific community that smoking was indeed harmful. And governments aimed to limit smoking by things such as public health messaging, like the Nazis did, funding smoking cessation programs, banning pro-smoking ads, higher taxes, like what King James did, and restricting children from buying cigarettes. This has largely been quite successful, as the rate of smoking since the 1960s has massively reduced in many developed countries. But tobacco companies have unfortunately found another new target in developing countries, and now the regions of Africa, South America and Asia are currently seeing massive increases in smoking rates, and smoking-related deaths will no doubt follow this. So despite the undoubtable evidence of the harms of smoking, it still remains a massive plague to human health everywhere. Despite the fact that we've got many resources in the effort to reduce tobacco smoking, as well as many other safer alternatives, people have always made bad health decisions for one reason or another, and doctors like myself have to manage these consequences as best as we can. And because of people's freedom of choice, I personally am uncertain about whether smoking will go away in the future or not.